Welcome to The Heart of the Matter, an Our Place podcast where we look at the issues surrounding homelessness, addiction and mental health on the streets of Greater Victoria. Hello, I'm Stephen Seltzer, Manager of Philanthropy for Our Place, and I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Fred Boone to today's Heart of the Matter podcast. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Fred. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Uh, just before we start, uh, I should mention that we respectfully acknowledge the Kwangan speaking people of the Songhees and Esquimalt Nations for their gracious hospitality while we provide programs and services on their ancestral lands. Uh, Dr. Boone, to jump right into it, how long have you been an emergency room doctor here in Victoria? I've been practicing emergency medicine in Victoria for over 15 years now. I graduated medical school in 2001 and got a chance to practice in uh, Alberta, BC, did some training out east in the Maritimes and even spent a few months uh, working in New Zealand. Wow. And you have seen so much in your time that you have written a book. <laughs> yeah, I've... Uh, written a book called uh, Your Inside Guide to the Emergency Department and How to Prevent Having to Go. And uh, it's for the layperson to try to answer some of the questions that I keep hearing out of the emergency department waiting room and to help people make solid decisions about whether they should go, maybe prevent a few people from, from coming, and also navigating the emergency department, which can be a really chaotic place, especially when you're struggling with pain or illness or you have a family member in crisis. Right. So it's not so much about suggesting people not go or, or figure out the symptoms they have if they should go, but more what to expect if they are going to make the trip down. That's right. Yeah. You can uh, have it on your bookshelf and, and use it to kind of have a little sneak peek behind the curtains of, of what we do, but uh, it can be a guide that uh, can help kind of figure figure your way out through something that uh, is is sort of organized chaos until you've had a familiarity with it. Right. And and volume two, I imagine, will be post-COVID. Yeah. Unfortunately, people are waiting sometimes four, six, even eight hours I've seen here in Victoria uh, from the time that they register to when they first get to see an eMERGE doc. And that's not even um, how long it takes for them to finish their investigations and be discharged, unfortunately. Right. Um, are you seeing anything better lately? The numbers are going down. Uh, hopefully soon the, the awful flus that we're seeing this time of year may even go down a bit. So is there light yeah. at the end of the tunnel for you right now in the ER? Yeah, it's so unpredictable, but I'm hoping things are stabilizing. Um, the province has tried to um, help the hospital system out by uh, reducing some of their overcapacity and that lets us move people that are stuck in the emergency department waiting for a bed in the rest of the hospital to to move along their their healing path right and i'm sure you're seeing a lot of the same people that we're seeing at our place people who are suffering from trauma physical mental injuries some people with with you know horrible effects of, of addictions yeah addictions chronic pain uh i think a lot of people are struggling right now especially in the last couple of years and it's it's still hard for people to talk about to be honest um people don't like talking about stress and anxiety and never mind if they're struggling with some sort of chronic pain problem or an addiction problem. Um, even uh, physicians, I, I sadly heard this weekend, Stephen, about uh, a couple physician suicides in BC. So um, I don't know the people involved directly, but it, it motivated me to actually um, start a uh, a Socks for Docs campaign. It started out of Australia where it was drawing attention to mental health in healthcare workers. And so uh, uh, there's a, a day in June, but even before then, where people were wear bright or fun or mismatched socks. And and uh, you can imagine just like that small amount of discomfort of, of wearing something so out there. Uh, and people ask, uh, you know, if there's something the matter, if your socks aren't, aren't matched together. And, and uh, yet, I think it's a good analogy for people that are struggling with something that they feel very different that that maybe they think people are walking you know looking at them and seeing something that where they stand out right. um so uh yeah i think mental health is certainly a problem across the board well and and these podcasts of course focus uh so much on the people that we try to serve but of course you mentioned the doctors nurses others uh orderlies and, and so on um based on what they see every day at work 
can create its own kind of trauma. And those are people who need help as well. That's right. Yeah. The last couple of years we've seen, especially in our nursing staff, they get a lot of the brunt, I think, of some uh, physical and verbal uh, uh, violence even. Um, and if they are taking time off work, if they are burnt out and, and can't come back, then it puts even more stress on those staff that are remaining in the emergency department. And we really rely on our team. You're right, you touched on some of them. There's uh, there's people that, that don't get the same sort of attention, like the unit clerks, there's housekeeping, there's um, respiratory techs, radiology techs, and everyone's facing uh, a staff shortage, but um, they're really some of the unsung heroes that that make the emergency department function. We wouldn't be able to do our job without them. Absolutely. Now, for a lot of the people that we serve, um, it must be, a, a, I mean, a lot of, if, if people come in for a physical injury, you can diagnose them, you can, you know, figure out treatment and so on. Uh, for a lot of the people that we serve, again, who, who are dealing with different kinds of trauma, uh, it must be frustrating that there's only so much you can do. Um, and, and to be honest, a lot of people end up in the hospital, uh, can't, can't be um, treated right away and end up back on the streets and then back at our place. Um, I guess, what are what are your thoughts on on, on that? that? That must be a frustration to know that someone's come in, you, you haven't been able to properly s- support them. Yeah, I tried to change my approach a little bit because it was getting me down the emergency department, because we sort of focus on episodic care or trying to just rule out life and limb threats, um, sometimes it, it feels like I'm not doing justice to people that come in with more chronic conditions. And that's gotten worse, especially since people haven't been able to access any sort of primary care and family doctors. Um, but but it's changed a little bit for me. I, I, I'm really trying to take ownership of some of those patient charts, some of those unloved uh, folks that come through the emergency department, um, some familiar faces to try to prevent them having to come back through the emergency department to rely on care. Um, and, and just think to myself, you know, if I can maybe move them a step or two forward on their path, you know, I might not be able to, to fix what's going on. And sometimes it's, it's like you say, trauma or stuff in the past that's, that's decades in the making. Um, and they really need some sort of established relationship with someone that I trust that knows their story without them having to start from scratch every time. But, you know, I, I do my best to try to figure out what the resources are in the area to, um, you know, put them in touch with anything that we have for our follow-up clinics or systems. Uh, sometimes there's partner organizations that come through the emergency department as well. Right. Uh, for example, and- um, I'm Umbrella workers will come and, and uh, visit people in the eMERGE. Right. And, and if yeah. you can diagnose them, at least you can get them into the system. Yeah, that's right. And and we are seeing a lot more um, subspecialization in that. So we have an addictions medicine consult service even. Oh. So uh, sometimes we'll bring people in to stay overnight in the emergency department just so that they can access those services. Because we know that sometimes people have a challenge. Maybe they don't have a phone or they don't have um, the ability to you know make it to an appointment at a certain date and time and so if we can help them out while they're there in the emerge and and meet them where they're at then then hopefully we can um, help them out knowing that you know addictions are difficult sometimes it takes more than than one go at things and so so i try to support them and and validate that it is difficult and that if they are looking for help that uh we're always open um but uh unfortunately there's always more demand for services, it seems, than there are services available. Now, if someone comes in, say, for an overdose, can you talk about the process of what typically would happen? Yeah, so oftentimes we'll get a heads-up phone call from the paramedics. So uh, usually a person that has overdosed, for example, on opioids, they may have been found down, um, not breathing, and... Uh, we're seeing a lot of bystander uh, Narcan in the community, which is fantastic because uh, that has saved a lot of people, I think. And then first responders are all armed with um, this this antidote. So by the time they come to the emergency, actually, uh, there's not a lot that I have to do. Mostly it's ruling out other um, either ingestions or, or making sure it's you know not something else where let's say they they fell down passed out and, and hit their head make sure that making sure there's no other major medical problem right. um, but a lot of the times people 
um, wake up and are walking and talking and, and can be discharged safely from the emergency department. Unfortunately, there are some cases where people have been um, maybe using a loan or have been found down for, for a prolonged period of time. And um, you can imagine trying to hold your breath for like 30 seconds versus trying to hold your breath for five minutes. And sometimes the brain doesn't get enough oxygen to survive. And those people uh, ultimately end up staying in hospitals, uh, maybe having a, a, an ICU stay and then um, either passing away or sometimes becoming an organ donor. Um, so it's, it's sad when we see those people that um, are from all walks of life, all ages. Well, that stat about most people who overdose do it in their own homes is, I think, is still the case, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure because sometimes uh, they may not make it to the emergency department. Right. But the the ones we see, um, oftentimes the the ones that that survive and and seem to have no adverse outcome, oftentimes it's because they um, were using in in a place where there was staff nearby, right. uh, you know, supervised consumption site, or um, they have a buddy, they have some sort of safety system where, um, you know, most of the time they're not not, not meaning to overdose, um, but with the toxic drug supply or sort of uncertainty as to, to what um, is in the substance that they're using, uh, they end up taking too much. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to see. Absolutely. And now, on our sites, uh, we have volunteer doctors and nurses. We have paid uh, paramedic outreach workers, and we try to do what we can on site to support people so they may not have to go to the um, emergency rooms. We, we do a lot of foot care because you, you can know if it left untreated, someone on the streets, uh, that, that can just lead to the worst kinds of situations and, and, and so on. I guess there's sort of a partnership there in terms of, and, and there's also a matter of trust that people that come to our place feel a little bit more trust, you know, if they see the, the doctor or, or nurse on site, it may take them a few weeks and then finally, you know what, um, have a conversation or, or even a checkup. So anything we can do to support the medical community, which, which of course helps the broader community in terms of hopefully, you know, wait times and, and so on. Basically, are there any other kinds of, you know, program services or from what you know about our places or a direction where different community groups can go or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, maybe just going back to, you know, what would happen if one of your staff paramedics um, helped prevent one person from coming to the emergency department. Um, so if someone were to arrive in the emergency, uh, they would usually be in one of our monitored beds, which is kind of a precious resource. There's, there's not a, um, many of those. Oftentimes those are full with, uh, with folks um, and nursing kind of uh, closer observation. And so um, save, you know, saving one person from tying up that, that bed for hours at a time means that we can get people in with chest pain to be hooked up to a cardiac monitor faster, for example, or someone with an allergic reaction. Uh, we can monitor them after they get their EpiPen on a cardiac monitor a little bit easier because um, without that, we, we still have people coming in and we're uh, just treating people the best we can. But oftentimes, um, you know, sometimes that's a that's a hallway stretcher or that's on an ambulance stretcher, you know, in their um, ambulance bay, unfortunately. Uh, we don't have the luxury of, of closing our doors uh, if the place gets too full or if, if there's not enough staff. So um, we do our best, but uh, in, in ideal circumstances, uh, it would be moving those patients into, um, a, you know, a stretcher and, and freeing up those paramedics to go back into the community and respond to mm -hmm. other calls, uh, you know, car collision and such. So um, I see how all the different parts of our healthcare system are interconnected. And um, just like primary care is super helpful, having boots on the ground at our place is also going to be super helpful. And like you said, preventing an infection before it, it got to that point of needing to come back to the emergency department, of needing to come in for daily IV therapy. Um, you know, that's really time and resource intense. Um, and uh, again, sometimes we'll have to admit those people to hospital because they may not have a safe place to go back to if they're uh, struggling with homelessness, for example, or, you know, transport being an issue of, of coming back and forth to the hospital. So um, every little bit helps. One of the barriers to people leaving the emergency department is sometimes not having that 
you know, shelter or a safe place to go back to. And so um, having those resources that our place provides is, is huge uh, for us to be able to keep people um, flowing through the emergency department and, and allow people to keep coming in. One of the things we certainly offer is a, a therapeutic recovery community for people and, and they stay with us between nine months to two years at New Roads long enough to actually help people with their triggers and, and so on, as opposed to uh, the the acute care, which is, you know, as, as important as anything, but uh, there's just so much work to do after that. Yeah, and I think some people are are ready for that. And uh, they may have experienced sort of the short-term detox revolving door of things. Um, and I got a chance to, to tour the, uh, uh, the site and, and it looks amazing. So um, that's, that's fantastic. And, and it's good to know that there are resources like that available in Victoria. Um, speaking of resources and knowledge, what are a couple of tips from the book that, uh, you know, you would suggest to people if they are making it to the ER that they wouldn't have thought of, or, you know, a couple ideas to help make things go a little easier or a little more knowledge when they're there. Yeah. I have a whole bunch of different sections and sidebars. Um, now that it's a little bit easier bringing, um, an advocate, uh, you know, a family member or a support person can actually be super Super helpful you know even when it's someone in the medical community when we're bringing a family member in sometimes our medical knowledge goes out the window or if 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 i'm the patient then i might be kind of distracted focusing on my pain or uh, whatever whatever else has brought me to the emergency department so it's easy to miss some of the details I know when I'm working, I'm talking too fast. So I, I try to write down all the details to give to people at the end of their um, stay with us. But having that sort of level-headed second person to be able to ask questions, to be able to provide information, to be able to um, assist, maybe getting a glass of water or a warm blanket or something when the nurses are, are busy running around doing other things, um, that can actually be super helpful. Um, there was a limit, of course, on on people that could come in, but I think those uh, restrictions are are slowly being lifted now. What what gives you hope? Uh, uh, how do how do you work in such a in, insane environment day after day? What um, what might be getting better, or what have you just learned? Uh, you know, in terms of uh, how how you make a difference that that brings you back the next day. Yeah, you're right. It can be tough some days. Uh, it can be tough to arrive to like a four hour wait, work my tail off for my entire shift and then uh, leave and then the wait time's only grown. Uh, but I think being part of a team is is certainly really helpful. So uh, I know a lot of us show up and bail each other out, uh, cover for each other being sick because it, it's part of a team and and we're looking out for each other. Uh, one, one talk that I heard uh, a fellow emergency doctor give on burnout, he said the opposite of burnout is engagement actually. And so for me, it's trying to find things that uh, spark some either joy or spark um, a sense of gratitude for me and, and trying to do those little things where I can, whether it's uh, you know, helping out with the uh, Hungry Hearts Gala or this uh, Socks for Docs campaign, um, or I try to do peer support for some of my fellow um, doctors at our staff association, all those things bring a little bit of meaning to me. And, you know, if I can reach one colleague, for example, that's suffering in silence um, and maybe help them through a difficult time, then that, that helps keep, keep me going. I know I've had some some hard times myself and and colleagues that would just check in and ask, hey, are you doing okay? And that that made a big difference to me. And, and it was hard to open up at the time when I was having, you know, struggles. But when I did, it became easier and easier. And, and you, you realize that, uh, that everybody's struggling in different ways. You know, everyone's fighting with something. Everyone's got, uh, a, you know, a silent battle that they're dealing with that maybe they don't share. And so when I found that I was being a little bit more genuine and authentic than, than, you know, the skeletons and other people's closets came out as well. And, Absolutely. and uh, yeah, you know, being able to see the humanity in every person. 
Uh, you know, whether it's the person that comes in with addictions and overdose um, or the uh, retired physician that comes in, you know, everyone um, ends up dealing with a health matter at some point in time. You never wake up thinking that it's going to be your day that you end up in the emergency department, but, uh, but we're all at risk and all, you know, one, one day going to end up there. Uh, meanwhile, though, we appreciate your, your humanity and your passion. And thank you so much for sharing here today. Thanks for inviting me on, Stephen. You've been listening to the Heart of the Matter podcast. For more information about our place and the vital programs and services provided to the Greater Victoria community, please go to www.ourplacesociety.com. Our Place is a registered BC charity. You can donate by visiting the website or by calling 250-940-5060. Help us to bring hope and belonging to those in need.